butterflies, but also bats, um, flies, hummingbirds, all kinds of other creatures, or it can rely on the wind, like corn. Some plants are self-pollinating. Come on, there we go. Um, some plants are self-pollinating and I highly recommend if you are beginning to save seeds that you stick with the self-pollinating plant for reasons we'll go into. Essentially, their pollen stays within the flower. It never leaves the flower. Every now and then there will be a little bit of cross-pollination, but it's mostly, everything is just right here. And that makes your job as a seed saver much easier. Some of the popular ones are peas, lettuce, tomatoes, and beans. Uh, I would actually recommend peas and beans as the absolute easiest things to save seeds from. Lettuce in my garden, usually doesn't live long enough to make seeds. It just kind of melts in the heat. Tomatoes are really fun, uh, but there is an extra step at the end of it. And we'll go over that extra step later on in the program. Once you have kind of found your feet in seed saving, you can branch out into the cross pollinating plants. And these are a lot of fun because they're, uh, they're just wild and wacky plants. Squash, melon, cucumber, the brassicas, corn, that's very advanced. Vocabulary time. Let's talk about hybrids versus open pollinated plants. So we've talked about self-pollinating and cross-pollinating plants, but this is a different distinction. Hybrids are when two different um, varieties of the same plant are crossed, either on purpose by people or by accident out in the world. And the first generation hybrid is a wild card. The ones that we buy from the store that are called F1, that's first generation, are chosen because they have qualities that we really, really like. They're reliable, they're resistant to disease, they're consistent. Um, the ones, the plants that we buy in the grocery store I mean, the vegetables that we buy in the grocery store are almost entirely hybrids because they fit so well into modern scale agriculture. It's kind of hard to save seeds from them. You can, but it takes years of dedication to dehybridize the seeds. Open pollinated plants uh, are heirlooms. They're a little bit more variable. They have a stronger concentration of flavor. They're a little bit funky looking sometimes. And you'll notice if you go through a seed catalog the of heirlooms, the descriptions are incredibly specific. Um, they'll, there'll be one kind of cabbage that's particularly good for clay soil. There's, there'll be one kind of cabbage that's particularly um, resistant to this nematode or that pest. And that's because all of these, um, all of these heirlooms were adapted in very local specific places. So the hybrids usually are designed to be anybody anywhere. Anybody anywhere can grow a better boy tomato, but a um, Cherokee purple tomato is a little bit more specific. It doesn't do everything that the better boy does. And that's because of that seed saving that we talked about earlier, those generations upon generations upon generations who were saving their own seeds and then eating the plants from those seeds. So if it was a good seed, let's say um, the world's most productive bean plant, Bob's, Bob's beans, the family, Bob's family, as they ate those beans thrived and did well they stayed on the farm. They kept passing those seeds on to their kids and their grandkids. And they probably even passed them on to their neighbors because it was a great bean. Now, across the way, there might have been Joe on his farm who had a kind of crummy batch of beans and his kids didn't thrive. They didn't want to stay on the farm. They moved to town and nobody ever kept uh, Joe's beans because they were not great. And that is why heirlooms are cool. They are the survivors. Let's do a little taxonomy as we keep refreshing our botany. And I am moving kind of fast 
please, if anybody has any questions, just hop right in there on the Facebooks. And um, I am in no hurry whatsoever. I just talk fast. Taxonomy. So this is a system of organizing plants um, developed by Carl Linnaeus. And it breaks them into different, um, different groupings. So the first, the biggest grouping is family. And this chocolate bell pepper that we're looking at here is in the Solanum family, that is nightshades. So it's cousins with tomatoes and eggplants and potatoes and belladonna. Then it's in the genus capsicum and capsicum just means pepper in Latin. Then it's in the species anum, which means it's an annual. And then it's in the variety chocolate bell. Usually when plants cross pollinate, they cross pollinate at the species level, usually. Some sources will tell you always only, some people have anecdotal evidence of things crossing otherwise. But then there's also the, the wrinkle that taxonomy is a living science. It changes all the time. All the time we discover, oh wait, I thought that was a capsicum, but really it's a something else. Um, you'll find that a lot with flowers. You'll find that uh, two different seed packets for the exact same seed might have a slightly different Latin name for the plant because we just don't know everything. One of my favorite families of seeds is the brassicas. They are a really wild bunch. All of these plants listed here, bok choy, broccoli, kohlrabi, mustard greens, canola, rutabagas, are all brassicas. So they're all in the same family. And then everything with an asterisk, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, and kohlrabi, are actually all the same species. They're just varieties of the same species. So they will cross with each other. Word to the wise though, usually um, cross-pollination, accidental hybrids are not very tasty if they're even fertile. But the, in my experience, the brassicas do cross very well with each other. They don't look anything like their parents, but they're still tasty. Another weird category is biennials. These are plants that are not annuals. They take two years to get through their natural life cycle. Uh, probably the most common for seed savers would be carrots and parsley. And the trick with saving these is you've got to keep them alive through the winter because they're in their first year, they put out leaves and that's their, their sort of childhood. And they, or in the case of carrots, they soak up sugars and store them in their, in their carrot part. And then in their second year, they bolt. That is, they suddenly shoot up and set out flowers and reproduce. So you've got to keep them alive through that first winter. If you have a harsh winter, like this last one that we had, they might not have survived it. If you have no winter, like we often have, then the plants don't know what time it is and they're going to bolt in a goofy, goofy time. The first plants that I actually ever saved seeds from were carrots and it was a mistake. Um, it was an accident. I had was going to do a fall garden and I had saved my seeds, oh, part of my springtime seeds in the fridge like I thought I was supposed to and they got moldy. And I was so mad at myself for wasting these seeds that I tore up the packets and added them to the mulch. And this was in September. By Thanksgiving, I had a lawn of peas and carrots. And the next year I had no idea where they were to dig them all up until all of a sudden the carrots started shooting way up. And even though it's not, it's very hard to save seeds from carrots well, they are gorgeous flowers. And if you ever forget one in the garden bed, do stick around and watch it because they are just a hoot. They smell wonderful. They attract so many pollinators. It's this huge umbilifer flower head. Oh, they're great. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I saved seeds from those. 
and without knowing anything about uh, isolating or cross pollinating. And then I grew those seeds and I noticed that every time I grew them out, they bolted faster and faster and faster because without thinking about it, I was selecting for fast bolting. Later, I would learn how to avoid that. Okay, so we talked about pollinating, cross-pollinating and self-pollinating. We talked about the pollen and the ovary. So how do we keep the wrong pollen from getting in your plant's ovaries? That's isolation. And the simplest way to isolate two plants is by distance. Different distances for different plants, depending on how readily they cross-pollinate. And usually it's, we measure isolation in distance, even if we're using other tools for the isolation. You can also use physical barriers, like this uh, little seed sack, little um, uh, organza sack, which is protecting a tomato flower. And tomatoes actually don't cross pollinate all that readily. So somebody really, really wants to breed this tomato very carefully. You can also do hand pollination, and that's fairly common with uh, squashes and cucurbits. And it's where you go out with, um, usually a paintbrush works best, a very soft paintbrush, and collect pollen from the flowers that you want, and then apply that to the female flowers that you want to pollinate and then you close the females up so they don't get any other um, pollen, which is getting pretty intimate with your plants. I will admit that. Uh, you can also use thyme. And this is a tool that sometimes people use for corn because corn is something that we grow usually in pretty large plots. It has like a mile isolation distance, which is a lot of space between your garden and the next garden. But if you can find a variety of corn that uh, pollinates either way before or way after anybody else who's growing corn around you, you can sort of wiggle around that. Uh, more about isolation distances. There is, um, Tom, did you put in the chat that uh, uh, link? You're muted, Tom. Tom, you're muted. <laughs> you're, you're still muted. I'm still muted? Now, now I can hear you, sorry. All right, too many things at once. Yes, the links are all posted at the top of the, uh, the Fantastic. chat. Fantastic, yep. thank you so much. Goodbye. Um, so some of those links are some very helpful things. One of them is a, a chart of common seed, isol seed saving isolation distances. And you'll see slightly different numbers from different people because this is not, it, it's kind of all played by ear, you know? Everybody has a slightly different idea of how, um, how pure seeds have to be or how freewheeling we can be. And that also kind of depends on why you're saving seeds, what your motivation is. If you are simply saving seeds for you to grow next year, it's up to you to decide how careful you want to be. Um, a farmer who's growing a huge amount of crops may have a little bit of wiggle room also. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are an organic seed farmer, you've got to have really, really, really pure seed or if you are um, trying to take care of one variety that you are incredibly passionate about, something very rare and something very special to you, you would take a lot of extra steps. Another thing to take into consideration is population size. Uh, the more plants you can grow, usually the better. And it depends on the crop, but some of them, especially uh, the cucurbits, they experience something called inbreeding depression. If they stay too pure, they get kind of, and they need to have a little bit of cross pollination every few generations to remain vigorous. A large population also gives you room to select 
you get to be really picky about which seeds you're going to save. It gives you some room for a few genetic mutations, which can also be really interesting to see. I wish I had that much room. I do not have that much room. All right, so let's kind of put all of this in practice. Let's think about what we want to save seeds of. One method that I recommend is thinking of yourself as the steward of one plant. Start with one plant that you are wild about. Something that if next year none of the seed catalogs had it, you would cry. Something that you just need to make sure remains on this earth. Um, or something that you love, but it's not perfect. And you think maybe I could make it perfect. Maybe I could just tweak it a little bit. Or what's the one kind of tomato that I can grow? I can't grow any other kind of tomato except this kind and I love it madly. So choose your plant. Uh, again, I highly, 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 highly recommend that you choose a self-pollinating plant if you are a beginner. Once you do that, you wanna to get to know it. Find out what its Latin name is, what its growth habit is, how it reproduces. Does it have any cousins that it might be cross-pollinating within the neighborhood? Like um, carrots and Queen Anne's lace can cross-pollinate. And think, really think hard about what your selection criteria are going to be. What do you want from this plant? Now, the mad scientist part. This is the fun part. Choosing what you want to select for. You can choose to select for whatever you want to. Uh, for instance, this is a Cherokee purple tomato, and they are subject to a lot of this striping, uh, scarring, cracking on the bottom. And that comes from when they have very sudden changes in moisture or temperature. Uh, so if you grow them in Oklahoma, you get a lot of that because there are very sudden changes in moisture and temperature. But let's say you were growing Cherokee tomatoes and you had two plants that had less cracking. What would you do? Save seeds from those and then grow them the next year and see what happens and maybe that year they have even less cracking. And eventually in a few generations, you have got a smooth bottomed Cherokee purple tomato and you can make a million dollars. You wanna choose your seed plants and mark them out. Um, a lot of beginning seed savers, myself included, first tried just saving seeds from the last peas on the vine or once you're done with the lettuce. But that well, lettuce actually works okay for that. But um, for most plants, peas and beans especially, you wanna mark some off and don't eat those. If you just save the very last peas and beans on the vine, you are again selecting for lateness. And that might be a trait that you want, but most of us don't. And that one plant or your seed plants, you wanna tie, put something on them like a ribbon to make it really visible and you're not gonna harvest or deadhead it, but it's gonna have to stay in the garden a little bit longer than your other plants. So you'll need to, um, if aesthetics are important to you, you might put it somewhere a little bit out of the way or put something in front of it because it can look um, kind of hairy. Go ahead and use your appropriate isolation steps. See, this is what I mean. This, this is lettuce bolting. Most of us don't find it all that attractive, but it's making more lettuce babies, so hey. Um, plant maturity. We usually eat, we, we usually prefer most of our plants at an immature stage. That is, we eat uh, zucchini that is not quite ripe. We eat the leaves of lettuce long before it starts reproducing. We enjoy flowers before they start pollinating and, um, producing seed. And so when we do seed saving, we actually let the plants grow out to their natural lifespan. And then you want to collect and process your seeds. And this, again, is a little bit different for every plant. Uh, 
usually you want to make sure it's very ripe and or dry. Uh, you'll let bean pods dry on the vine. You'll let uh, tomatoes get fully, fully like ripe. Sometimes you will need you'll need to be careful about shattering like a poppy seed pod. Once it decides to open, it's just everywhere. So you need to um, kind of keep an eye on it, keep it contained. Sometimes you'll also want to winnow or otherwise remove the chaff, all the stuff around the seed that is not actually the seed itself, both for storage and um, to prevent disease. So how do you know? How do you know exactly when to harvest the seed? How do you know all these tips and tricks? Well, if you just picked one plant, then that's a lot easier to get hold of. Uh, and I, I will, there are lots of books about seed saving in that list of resources. There is a bibliography I put together. There are lots of other great resources. There are lots of great seed saving resources online. Any seed catalog that's clearly geared towards seed savers and heirlooms will have info, uh, but there is also my very favorite gardening tool, the search engine. When in doubt, just look it up. Okay, now we got a question here. You wanna take Excellent. it now? This is from Anne. She, she's asking, uh, does it matter which tomato from an individual plant that you save seeds from? Hmm, I don't think so. But again, like with the beans and peas, um, I would say if you, if you choose a later tomato, one of the ones that produces later, then you're selecting for lateness. And since usually on a tomato plant, if you don't keep picking them, it doesn't keep producing, it's probably best to, to leave one whole tomato vine to be for your seeds. Does that make sense, Ann? I think it made sense. Well, she'll, okay. She'll talk. okay. We got a, about a 10 second delay here. So we'll of course, see. of course. Well, if it doesn't make sense, then just pipe up again, Ann, okay? And then the most important step, storage and labeling. We've already heard uh, a story about bad storage and the things that can go wrong with that. What seeds generally want is cool, dark, and dry. Those are the um, conditions that they prefer. And even more important than that is that they be stable. So if it's not as cool as it might be, but it's dark and dry and stable, that's fine. If there's a lot of fluctuation, that makes your seeds much, much, much more vulnerable. And in most of our houses, the best place to find cool, dark, and dry and stable is in the refrigerator. So you wanna seal up your seeds, get them very, very dry, seal them up, maybe put a little um, desiccant packet, you know, for a shoe box in there to help keep them dry and then label them, label them, label them, write labels. Include as much information as you can. Um, if you can make some notes about how the plant grew or what you liked about it, or um, was it particularly well adapted to this situation or that situation, that's all great, but you absolutely have to write down at least the variety and the date collected. Because if you're doing this in September, you will not remember in March. And also tell, tell, include the story if you can. Um, this bag of Kentucky White Hickory corn, um, a dent corn was donated by someone who has a, um, a nursery in Pegs. And she sent me this with this story. And I presented this slide at I think the first full semester gardeners series at the library and two people in the audience said, oh, I'm from Owensboro, Kentucky, which I thought was just absolutely amazing and one of the cool things about um, heirloom seeds. And then you share them, keep growing the plants. A place like Svalbard, that seed bank, that's for preserving frozen seeds. But the more we grow these seeds in any different locale in lots of different situations, then we're sort of slowly creating these perfectly locally adapted plants. And you can share them at seed swaps. You can 
send them to people, you can make seed bombs, you can donate them to the seed library if you'd like. Let's look at a couple of specific plants. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let's pretend that uh, I'm going to pick one of these plants that I am growing to be my seed saving project for the year, just sort of as a, a way to frame this. So the first one is the Lincoln pea. Um, we're going to kind of rate each one. So we know it's Latin name, it's self-pollinating, it has a very small isolation distance. It's a vine, which I like, I like growing vertically. It is not especially rare. It is fairly adaptable. The flavor is good. It's a really reliable pea. And because it's a pea, it gives me great, great joy. I cannot walk by a pea plant without talking baby talk to it. I just adore them. Now, it's not the most exciting pea, I'm gonna tell you that right now. There are other like cooler ones, but someone donated a whole lot of it to the seed library. And so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and check it out and grow it and see if I can find a few, grow a lot of it, and see if I can find a few vines that have a little bit more heat tolerance than the others and try to save some seeds from those and see if I can slowly, gradually make this pea a little bit more heat tolerant. So that's, that's bachelor number one. Matt's wild cherry tomato. All right, this is a wild tomato. It's, it's also called a coyote. It is a fairly unruly vine, but the flavor is amazing super intense, super intense, little tiny tomatoes, super intense. And one of the things I love about this is it truly is wild. So regular tomatoes are, we have engineered to play nicely in our gardens. They're not as sprawly as this wild tomato, but they have very specific needs for water and sunshine and how we take care of them. They're, they're like, um, Cocker Spaniels. And this truly is a coyote. It can take care of itself. It can tolerate drought. It can tolerate a lot of shade. It is really the only tomato that I've ever had any success with. So I think it's a great, bachelor number two is, uh, is looking good here. We were going to talk about wet processing tomatoes and that is um, no better, no time like the present. So tomato seeds and a few others, squashes and such, have this like sort of silvery coating on them. You'll notice when you um, take them out of the tomato and dry it. And that coating is there to inhibit germination because in the wild, like with our, our coyote tomato that's just sprawled somewhere in, uh, on a beach in Central America, um, they don't, usually want to sprout right where they fall. If a tomato seed sprouts right where it falls, then it's going to be right next to its mom and competing with its mom. Whereas, but the tomato purposely put the seeds in a tasty little fruit. So what the tomato wants to have happen is an animal comes by, eats the tomato, walks away and poops. And then the seeds are in the poop and the plant grows somewhere else. And the, um, that germination inhibiting coating um, is worn away by the animal's gastric juices. So to sort of mimic that without actually having to poop, we're going to scoop out all of the stuff of a ripe, ripe, ripe tomato, all that sort of slimy bit in the middle that's around the seeds, put it in a jar, add some water, stir it and cover it with something like a cheesecloth. Stir it every day and a mold will form on the top. After a few days, rinse it out and let them dry and you'll have gotten rid of that coating. And then the next person who grows those tomato seeds will have a much easier time getting them to germinate. 
Uh, here's a fun one. Okay, this Upland Cre Crest Creasy Greens. This is a very fun plant to grow. It is a uh, super peppery, cool weather salad plant. And I think it is delicious. It's like arugula plus, you know. Um, the flavor is fantastic. It's not super well adapted, uh, but it is delicious and I can work around it. It's fairly hard to come by. It gives me a great deal of pleasure. There are some questions though about the actual seed saving. First of all, it's a biennial. Can I keep that up? I just don't know. Because with a cool weather biennial, I've not only to get have to get it through the winter, I've got to get it through an Oklahoma summer. And that could take some doing. Now, isolation distance has a question mark. That's because this is actually a species. There um, aren't any varieties of crests to cross with. So I don't think cross-pollination is going to be an issue. Uh, here's another fun one. All right, Poppy Pepperbox, which sounds like an English children's book. Um, it is insect pollinated. It has quite a uh, uh, isolation distance, 250 feet. But it's, I know that, I know for a fact that none of my neighbors are growing poppies this year. I live in a neighborhood with alleys. I walk up and down and I peek in people's backyards no poppies. So I think I have a little bit of wiggle room. There's also, um, with a lot of flowers, there is more wiggle room in general because we're not relying on it to taste like anything. I mean, actually this poppy we might use as an herb, but um, you can, it's kind of fun actually watching, especially the very common gar cottage garden flowers, sort of, you just let them reseed and reseed and reseed each year and they sort of revert back to wild form, like all the fancy things about them kind of get sloughed off and they, they return back to the color and the shape that is their, their ideal form for themselves, which is, I think, kind of cool. So these are not especially rare. They are fairly adaptable. Um, I don't really use a lot of poppy seeds in my cooking, uh, but they make me very, 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 very happy. And they also would be very easy to just let seed in the yard and not even collect. And the next is actually kind of a project. It's not one of the, not really one of the bachelors, but a fun thing to do. And that is creating a Grex. A Grex is sort of like a casual cross. Uh, and what you do is you grow a couple of different kinds of, in this case, brassica in the same bed and maybe grow them out a few times, grow them out a few times. Don't do anything with them, don't cross pollinate them. Just let them sit there together, let them uh, go to seed and see what happens. And this one is, this pictured here is one of my very favorite salad greens. It's called tot soy or a spoon mustard. And it's basically like a little tiny baby, baby bok choy. I mean, it's so cute and extremely mild, very tasty, very tender leaves. So a lot of fun things can come out of this and you feel sort of like you have this perpetual salad bed, which also feels really good. All right, next let's talk about using the seed library. So what is a seed library? And uh, most people, when I say seed library say, what? Uh, what? How does that even work? So we have seeds at uh, several different locations and you can check out up to 15 packets per season. Then we ask you to take them home, grow them, and if you can, save some seeds from your best plants and bring those back to us, but there's no penalty if that doesn't work. You can also bring in seeds that you save from other things or uh, leftover commercial packets, so long as they're open pollinated and not hybrid. We're, we're really pretty open about that. And we have, we try really hard, this is our seventh year, 
at TCCL. And we try really hard to have a lot of good stuff that you want to grow, um, but it's not always perfect. It's not really a seed catalog. We'll get into a few tips and tricks with that. So you can browse the catalog and place holds online and, or you can come in in person about five of our seed locations are currently open for express service. Availability, like I said, we're not a catalog. So we're gonna have different stuff every day, but you may need to be kind of flexible about what you want. Um, Question. Yes. Uh, Janine asks, can you only check out a few seeds versus a whole packet? No, they just come as um, the okay. whole. I think, she, okay. I think she wants to know how many seeds is she going to get when she. Ah, well, our seed packets are pretty darn small. Um, we, when we first started, we were going kind of packaging kind of like commercial seed packets do. And the main complaint we got the first two years was this is too many seeds. So we, we shrank it down quite a bit. Um, and I thought I had a packet right here to show you, but I don't. Um, but it's, it's definitely just enough for like a small urban garden. Um, you can, if you can, tell us if you're returning stuff, tell us some stuff about your seeds. Um, these are two really stellar uh, seed returns. Look at all that information they've given us. Very nice, very nice. Um, a lot of the things in the seed library <clears throat> may be in the catalog. Cataloging garden seeds as if they are books is a little bit fiddly because people will check everything out and then check all of a particular variety out. And then it still shows in the catalog as something you could put a hold on, but you can't actually get them until the next season, you know, or maybe even the next year. It's a little bit misleading. So I would encourage you, if you are wanting to use the seed library, to look at the availability and see if there are actually not checked out copies of something. Uh, and be kind of flexible about varieties. Um, you know, there may be a million of this kind of lettuce and none of that kind of lettuce. Uh, just kind of play it by ear, you know. Um, where is the list? Oh, crumb bum. I had the list. So I uh, had a list on a slide that is not here of all of the seed library locations. So I'm just gonna say them. They are Bigsby, Collinsville, Central, Glenpool, Hardesty, Martin Regional, Nathan Hale, Suburban Acres, and Zero. And right now, Collinsville, Central, Hardesty, Martin, and zero are all open for express service. So you can actually go in and browse the seeds there if you don't want to just search on the internet, search on the catalog and uh, um, request them that way. And one of the links in that post of resources is um, a link to just a seed search. So if you open that link, you will be in the middle of a seed catalog search. And I think that's pretty much all I had to say. All right. All right. Not a whole lot of que uh, questions. One, uh, Jane said, when you're talking about the uh, poppy pepper box, she said she had some of that, but it never germinated. I guess she had troubles getting it to germinate. Yeah, poppies are hard to get to germinate. Um, they are tricky. And they don't like transplanting either. I kind of feel like the best way to grow poppies is kind of like sunflowers. Um, once you have one, you can have them forever, but they are really best at growing themselves.
And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hang here for a minute for a few more. Yeah, um, of course, of course. I'm not, I don't have anything going for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> 14, no. no. People are just saying thank you for, for this. Uh, awesome, good. Well, I thank you all very much for coming here for this Lunch and Learn. I love getting to talk about seeds and I love getting people into seed saving. Do you remember those four resources as to what, what they were links to? Do you want to run down through what, what there are yeah, links available up in the feed? Yeah, hang on one sec. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But before I do that, I do want to say I'm giving you all my email address for a reason. If you have any questions later on, please feel free to write to me. If you can't remember my name, you can just write to the library and ask for the seed lady and they will know who you're talking about. And I would be more than happy to help you with stuff in the future, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. All right, and now uh, we, have another, we have another question here. I, I'll, I'll interrupt what you're gonna do before our question disappears. This is from Jane. They say, what if I turn some seeds in and they're not good? They won't germinate for someone else or, or they're a hybrid and I didn't know. Well, um, that is part of the caveat cultivator. We are not a seed company. We don't do germination tests. We cannot guarantee our seeds, especially if they're home saved. Um, so you takes your chances <laughs> as pretty much, uh, you don't pay your money and you takes your chances. Um, can't beat the price. Exactly, exactly. Um, da, 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 da. Resources, okay. So of the links, uh, one was an isolation distance guide from seedsavers.org. Uh, one was a link to the about page explaining uh, the seed library. One was uh, to a search within our catalog and if you don't want to hit that link, I'll just tell you, when you're searching in our catalog, type in seed library and you'll get all the seeds that are currently available. If you um, get, if you type in seed library tomato, you'll get all of the tomatoes that we have currently available. If you type in um, a very specific thing, then you'll get the specific thing. Uh, books about seed saving. Uh, if you want to dig a little deeper and do a little bit of research on your own, these are books that I recommend. And what she's talking about are some links to resources that are further up in the uh, post. They're in the history of the, toward the top of it. You can click on those links and find them there. I had a question and I'm just, just curious, how common in libraries across the country are seed libraries? That is a good question. Um, when we started, there were, and that was in 2014, there were probably about 100 sure. around the country. Um, not all of them were in libraries. There are some that are not in libraries. And um, then by now there are, there have been probably several hundred. Not all of them have quite taken off. Um, ours has been a huge success. I spent a lot of the summer when we were closed doing sort of virtual field trips, checking in with other seed librarians around the country, especially ones in cities and systems are of a roughly similar size. And um, what I found was that actually most of them were doing curbside service, but they weren't able to, they were struggling to get seeds available to customers. Um, and that is part of the, the, why I'm really happy that we can have the seeds actually in the catalog and you can actually request them and pick them up uh, because that made it a lot easier for our customers. We actually, seeds, we reopened for curbside service in late May. And frankly, last year was an incredibly mild summer, but there were, all these Tulsans everywhere gardening. It was a mild, wet summer. And we actually raised our checkout limit from seven to 15. And seeds were the only physical material whose circulation went up last summer over the year before. 
well, because they were just everybody wanted them. Well, I, and it, it's always a resource I was not available of before I got involved here, but uh, I was not aware of before I got involved here, but being able to check out the seeds from the library. I mean, one of the objections or pushbacks you get from people sometimes about uh, starting a garden is, well, I can't afford it. You right. Know? I mean, well, you can afford this because yes. I mean, if, if you could pick up 15 packs of seeds and a pack of seeds is say an average of maybe, we'll just say $5, that's $75 worth, worth of yeah. seeds that you can just go just go get for the fun of it, thanks to yeah. our friends here at the library. So that's pretty awesome. Good Absolutely. job. Access, access is um, our number one foundational reason for being. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's fun, I think it's cool, but making sure that everybody has access to um, healthy food, outdoor exercise, and a little bit of what I call um, uh, down and dirty STEAM learning. You know, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, which I, I feel that seed saving definitely fits into. Um, absolutely, yeah. And if we also um, work hard to make sure that people have, a lot of our programming is around, uh, say, DIY container gardening, you know? If, if you don't even have, if you can't even afford a pot, can you find a bucket behind a restaurant? You know, um, and that's, that's, that has been fun. Right, no, it's, it's awesome. It's a great resource and, and not everybody knows about it. And hopefully this will help uh, inform more people that it is there and available for them. And if they, that is their hesitancy to garden or maybe they just wanna try some new stuff. What a great way yeah. to just experiment, I mean. That's, that's also, I, I kind of wanted to make, I try to make sure that there are some weird things that people might hesitate to spend the three or five dollars on, but like I could take a chance on that, like the noodle beans that you were talking about earlier, I, the noodle beans or yard lung beans, those are a fantastic thing to grow. Um, I love getting in, uh, because we live in Oklahoma, I love getting in a lot of, um, what I call summer spinaches, that is leafy greens that you can actually grow in the summertime, like Malabar spinach, that people might, again, be a little bit like, I don't know if I really like it. Right. Um, and so you can experiment. And I think that's, that's absolutely the name of the game. Right. All right, well, we're getting lots of thank yous and uh, Excellent. Good job, and we appreciate it. Lots of good info, a little, all the good stuff heading your way, Joanna. Excellent. Excellent. Anyway. Well, I am so glad to have been here today. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching. And um, what have we got next week, Tom? Next week, I believe is herbs, if I am uh, remembering Ooh. correctly. I think next week is herbs. If not, it'll be something else. <laughs> it's either herbs or tomatoes, right? Herbs or tomatoes. Both are worthy topics, I believe. They are. <laughs> they are. All right. Well, Thank you all again for being here. If uh, this will live on on Facebook, if you want to watch it and likely be posted some other place, but thanks for being here and uh, we'll see you next week. And thank you, Joanna.